All right, well, welcome to everybody to the Transforming Privileged Access webinar. Uh, my name is Diana Joven. I'm the VP of Marketing here at Teleport, and I'll be moderating uh, today's event. Um, I'll introduce our two guests in just a moment, but first I'd like to note on the right side of the screen, there is both a chat and a Q&A button, Q &A button for question and answers. Um, we invite you to introduce yourself and let us know where you're dialing in from in the chat. And uh, feel free to ask questions in the Q&A tab at any time during the event. If we don't get to them, we'll follow up with you um, after the webinar. And as an added bonus, everyone who attends today will receive a white paper authored by our guest speaker, Jack Poehler. So this will be available uh, next week and we'll email it to you uh, when it's ready. So now it's my pleasure to introduce our guests. So first I'd like to welcome uh, Jack Poehler. Um, Principal Analyst Jack Poehler uses his 35 years of industry experience across a broad range of security system storage networking and cloud-based solutions to help marketing and management leaders develop winning strategies in highly uh, competitive markets. Prior to founding Paradigm Technica, Jack worked as an analyst at Enterprise Strategy Group covering identity security, identity and access management, and data security. And previously, Jack led marketing for pre-revenue and early stage uh, storage networking and SaaS startups. Jack was also recognized in the Architect Power 100 ranking of analysts with the most sustained buzz in the industry with, um, with information featured in a variety of um, high profile uh, media outlets. So thank you, Jack, for joining us today. Thank you, it's my pleasure. Uh, let me also introduce Ev Klintsevoy. So Ev is the co-founder and CEO of Teleport and an en engineer by training. Uh, Ev launched Teleport in 2015 to provide other engineers with solutions that allow them to quickly access and run any computing resource anywhere on the planet without having to worry about security and compliance issues. The serial entrepreneur, Ev, was CEO and co-founder of Mailgun, which he uh, successfully sold to Rackspace. So welcome, Ev. Great to be here. So today we'll talk about six topics for about five minutes each, and at the end we'll have about 10 minutes of Q&A. So without further ado, let's kick this off. So topic number one is threats. Let's start with the trends in the threat landscape. So the question at hand is what trends do companies need to be considering when developing their cybersecurity strategy? And so, Jack, let's start to you. Let's start with you. When companies talk to you about cybersecurity threats, what type of threats are they most concerned about? Sure. I think I, I boiled down the major threats into sort of three major categories, uh, ransomware, zero day attacks and uh, identity related threats. And ransomware and zero day attacks get a lot of press. Uh, ransomware because it's very, very common and it causes a lot of damage. And zero day attacks, I think, get a lot of attention uh, because they're unknown and people don't really understand them. The reality is, however, that almost no organizations are attacked by zero day attacks. They're really uh, less than 5% of all attacks in that we've recorded. When we look at um, threat research from companies like Verizon or all of the major security companies, we find that the cyber, uh, sorry, uh, ransomware is one of the largest uh, attacks that we get, but most ransomware and most of the other attacks really start with an identity related attack where an attacker uses either stolen credentials or phishing or new forms of phishing uh, SMS based uh, phishing, which is called smishing, or even now the most recent attacks use artificial intelligence voice per impersonation to do a voice based attack on identities. And all of these attacks are really an attempt to social engineer a user into giving up their secrets that they've shared secrets that are stored on a server somewhere to get access to your organization. And once they get access to your organization, all bets are off and they can start wreaking havoc one way or another. So really, I think the big thing organizations need to be thinking about is uh, how to protect their identities. Fantastic. And, uh, you know, Ev, you talked to a lot of companies about threats as well. Have you seen any changes over the last few years that are driving stronger attention to privileged access? Um, absolutely. So organizations are starting to recognize the trend uh, that Jack was uh, pointing out. 
that uh, vast majority of attacks, successful attacks, and pretty much all the recent attacks that we've seen, uh, like in the news lately, I'm not going to name companies not to make them uh, feel bad, like they were all based on uh, attackers going after um, a mistake that human is making. It's something that I actually want to highlight that um, like we, like as any industry cybersecurity space, like we developed our own jargon. And so we say things like identity attack, identity attack all the time. Uh, but I much uh, rather prefer to use the term um, uh, <clears throat> attacks based on human mistakes, because uh, for an identity attack to succeed, someone within the organization needs to make a mistake. And therefore, uh, so the trend that we're seeing is that like uh, most sophisticated organizations are trying to engineer their in infrastructure uh, security and their infrastructure access policies to be immune to bad human behavior. Um, that really is what enables identity attacks, humans' behavior. And the reason why they also... Uh, raising in popularity is just because there is no direct uh, kind of technological response to humans accidentally doing the wrong thing. And I do want to mention that like the rise of generative AI is going to be, uh, mu it, it will have much bigger impact than maybe most people realize on kind of cybersecurity landscape. Why? Because AI dramatically lowers the cost of mounting an attack. Because in all forms of security, cyber or physical, it's really kind of an arms race at uh, defense versus offense, which means that the cost of attacking you should be higher than the cost of uh, protecting. And a generative AI allows uh, like a teenager from the Chicago suburbs to be launching identity attacks like several companies at the same time. So, uh, so it's coming. So which means uh, that the, the trend is to design infrastructure access um, around the idea that behavior of humans should not, uh, that infrastructure should be uh, resilient to bad behavior of people. That's really what makes you uh, protected against uh, identity attacks. Okay, fantastic. All right, so I'm sorry, Jack, you wanted to... Oh, I was just going to add real quickly. I think that's a, it's a really important point to consider that from the cybersecurity industry as a whole, we've been very, very focused on uh, tools that, deal with computers, not tools that deal with humans. And, you know, a, a computer is going to behave the same way every single time. So it's very easy to make security control to deal with however that computer behaves. When you throw humans into the mix, their behaviors are completely all over the place and they're not very predictable. Um, so it's a lot harder to create a tool to deal with a human failure or human issue or human manipulation or social engineering. And so the industry hasn't been focused on that very lately. It's only now that we see, you know, Teleport and other organizations that are looking at this particular form of the issue. All right, so um, let's move on to topic two. So in your white paper, Jack, you talk about the differences between what the, the way that um, technology operates in traditional IT functions versus modern infrastructure functions. Can you talk about what are these differences that influence how companies should think about security and privileged access? Sure. Well, we've got a sort of a long history of the way uh, corporate IT, enterprise IT, and organizations have grown up to manage their compute infrastructure. And it really starts from the fact that we started with one computer and we added one computer and then we added a couple of network devices and we added a storage server and then we added a database and slowly over time we added these devices. And we didn't have, while we thought about it as complex, it was very standardized. You had a set of storage devices, a set of compute servers, a set of network devices and maybe a database server and that was it. Now, all of that was managed manually where an administrator would log into each device and configure the device. When a new device came on, you would put it in the rack and you would start managing it manually and configure it manually. And in most, uh, even today, in, until you get to very, very large companies and very large database, uh, sorry, uh, data centers, 
most companies, their administrators can, in the off the top of my head, they know exactly where every single device is, and they can point to it and say, I have 20 disks running in that storage device, and I know all the storage, where it's allocated to, and all of that's managed in their heads, and they or on a by Excel spreadsheets, and it's not a very big complex problem. Then when we turn to and we get the cloud era and we start getting into very, very large scale where we're talking about not tens or hundreds of devices, but hundreds of thousands to millions of devices, it becomes impossible to do that manually. So over time, we've developed ways to automate this. And we think about these things in terms of how do we automate and standardize and treat everything so that instead of an administrator configuring a particular server, the administrator thinks about and says, this is the state I want this to end up in. And here's a program that can go and take this pile of hardware and software and do all the configuration automatically to put it into the state I want it. And then if I want to change the state, I just say, hey, here's the new state I want it to be in. And I let the tools do all the work and everything is automated. And that creates a different way of approaching and managing your environment and different problems then, because now instead of just worrying about one or two administrators, we have to worry about uh, the automation tools and what identities they have and what access they have to the environment. And we have to worry about uh, the people and the programs that are doing this instead of the people managing it. So it becomes a sort of a different problem space and a different way of thinking about it. Okay, and Ev, um, you know, you've worked with a lot of companies that start with trying to apply traditional IT technologies to modern infrastructure stack. So what problems have they encountered and what advice do you give to companies um, when they're trying to solve this problem in a modern infrastructure environment? Uh, sure. So I would categorize uh, mo like modern infrastructure as presenting two major challenges. Uh, from a security perspective. One is what uh, Jack already covered pretty well. Modern infrastructure is managed with code. Uh, it's elastic. It, it, uh, it grows and shrinks. You simply cannot dedicate enough attention to each individual device. So uh, provisioning as code, basically, uh, uh, it, it places certain constraints on what kind of tools you could use actually to, to, to secure it. So manual uh, configuration is out the window. Um, and, and the second major challenge is explosion of complexity overall. So gone are the days when uh, when organizations could say that, hey, we're a Microsoft shop or we're like Sun Microsystems shop where we use Microsoft SQL Server, we use Microsoft Windows, we use everything Microsoft where everything is neatly and tightly integrated. So I could use Active Directory and all these like, access controls that Microsoft designed to protect my infrastructure. That's just no longer true. In, in the modern cloud environment, uh, companies have hundreds of different technologies that are built by different vendors. They don't interact with each other. So you could start enumerating like every single layer, like you have Linux at the bottom, then you have virtualization, there's like some VMware involved, maybe OpenStack, then there's containers, Kubernetes, microservices, CI CD pipeline. I so almost sound like a stand up comedian when I start enumerating all these things, but they go up and up and up. So you have hundreds of these layers. Every single layer has its own identity. It has its own uh, authentication. It has its own uh, encryption and secure connectivity. It has its own um, authorization, its own role-based access control that's not compatible with any other layer. There is an audit layer and compliance implications. And there is a talent shortage. You actually don't have people on your team who understand how to secure every single thing. So this fragmentation of identities then leads to uh, fragmentation of policy. And, and that basically creates a, this perfect storm a perfect environment for humans to make mistakes, which goes back to my earlier point, is that your infrastructure needs to be immune to human uh, behavior. Um, and because all of this is controlled by code, uh, you also have to keep in mind that infrastructure is most vulnerable from a security uh, perspective when it's getting provisioned. So, so you, which means that you have engineers who write all these scripts that provision infrastructure, which basically means that you, that any person who is capable of coding can accidentally commit a mistake and you will get exposed. So to sum it up, that's what I would highlight. That the fact that infrastructure is elastic and provisioned as code that prevents, uh, presents a challenge. And the second one is that complexity is absolutely overwhelming. So let's let's drill down on privileged access a little bit further. And at this time, we'll start with you, right? 
often when you talk about modern infrastructure environments, you point out that all users are privileged, right, in some way. So in that environment, right, what should companies be looking for as a way to solve the security implications of, of how to interface with all of this technology? So um, I like the way you put it, like all users are privileged. That is the best way to think about privileged access management for modern infrastructure. So separating users, like separating engineers into privileged and non-privileged simply makes no sense. You may even have an intern who's hacking on or coding on, on a Terraform script that is part of your production deployment. So that person makes a mistake uh, for, uh, and, and that script is responsible for provisioning infrastructure. And now you are going to be exposed. So that's one reason to be concerned. The second reason is, uh, so if we accept the fact that engineers are actually responsible, not only for building applications and running these applications, but also they're responsible for securing the infrastructure. And that just simply happens automatically because they're responsible for provisioning it. So my earlier point is that whoever provisions infrastructure is kind of like a super user, kind of like a root user for everything that you have. So which means that engineers, they will inevitably facing this kind of security versus productivity trade-off. So if I'm an engineer working in an organization and I'm and and I'm building a, a system that does deployment and provisioning of infrastructure, I have all the incentives in the world to provision it in a way that's convenient for me to use it later. And that's not necessarily the most secure way to access infrastructure. I guess what I'm saying is that it's quite common in organizations where engineers are essentially building backdoors into the infrastructure. So just for their own convenience, so it's easier for them uh, to use it later. Um, so this is why we keep reminding our customers that like, do not overdo it on a security side. If you make it, if you make your engineer's life absolute hell, that it's really, really hard for them to get their uh, work done because of all these kind of security controls, all the red tape, like constant login, login, login. Um, like you are creative incentives for them uh, to uh, to commit undesirable human behavior and essentially build back doors. So we like to remind them that, hey, remember that secure path should be the happy path or the happy path should be secure path. Like they have to be the same. Okay, so, um, you know, Jack, uh, we talked yesterday, I think, about privileged access mm -hmm. management and how uh, what people are, the problem that people are trying to solve can be different in traditional IT uh, environments and and modern infrastructure environments, and I'm I'm using those terms kind of loosely right. to describe those worlds that you described at the start of the call. So, can you talk briefly about what problems people are trying to solve in each case and and what what that means? Well, if you think about privilege access management, it comes about and and Ev was mentioning this as well as again we sort of look back at history and you had a set of group of people who were privileged at users, they were admins, they were responsible for configuring your environment. And they had the ability, we call them admins, super users, root users, they had the ability to not only provision things, but turn them on and turn them off. Um, and you know, when so so we said we have normal users who can just do normal things. They can use the services IT is providing. And then we have these privileged users who have these extra capabilities. And we said uh, in the beginning of the industry, beginning of privilege access management, we said maybe that those privileged users should be, we should have extra security, which should think about them separately because they have this extra ability. So for example, I was talking years ago at the beginning of the PAM history to one of the major banks and they had a very large virtual infrastructure uh, with VMware, and they had uh, somewhere around 500 administrators, any one of which could log on to any virtual machine in the environment and any virtual machine server and do a shutdown. And they did that, you know, in the normal course of maintenance, they would have to do that to replace hardware or whatever it is. But because there was no extra controls, if they shut down by accident, they logged into the wrong machine, say VM 13 instead of VM 12, they could actually shut down the bank, complete programs and turn the bank off with, by mistake. So that's very risky. And it's even riskier than if somebody steals their access, their credentials and gets access and can do that. So we said, let's protect those users separately. Um, when we think about what Dev was talking about in, in the modern infrastructure where you have DevOps, the engineers 
are building the code. They're instantiating the services and running them as well as using them. And they use the same identity to use the services, create the services, configure and deploy and manage those. So anything that they do is going to be, as I've said, this essentially privileged access. But even more importantly, it comes down to thinking about any user has access to your data to a set of data. And so they should, all users should have the same protection in terms of authentication, making sure that they're valid users. And then they should all have what we call the principle of least privilege access. Users should only be given privileges to do what they need to do to get their job done, no, and no more than that. And that's sort of critical for securing your organization, whether it's uh, traditional IT or modern IT. But when we think about it in the modern sort of modern infrastructure case with DevOps, what does that mean in terms of least privilege access when they really need to have all this extra access? So then you want to think about, well, instead of giving them blanket privileges to do everything, how do I get tighter control over that? And how do I say, um, let's make sure that if they do a shutdown or they do a, a reboot or something like that, that's a super critical activity that they're authorized to do that and they're doing the right thing at the right time and not give them standing privileges to do that at any time in any place. And Ev, you've embedded some of these principles, right, in, in the Teleport Access Platform. Do you want to talk about what some of those security principles are and why they matter in this environment? Um, absolutely. So the first principle is so going back to how do we make sure that our infrastructure is protected in a way that it's resilient to bad human behavior? Um, I will probably disappoint the audience by saying that, hey, you cannot do that. Like humans are very unreliable, moist robots. Like we will continue to make mistakes no matter the amount of training that we go through. So people will be periodically responding to phishing emails and fake phone calls and clicking on the wrong links and opening the wrong attachments. That will, will never be stopped. But uh, not all is lost. You can still make your infrastructure resilient to this behavior by preventing attacker of exploiting bad human behavior. Because remember, like all these human mistakes eventually lead to credential theft, because that really is the target of an identity attack is to steal someone's credentials. Uh, because uh, commonly credentials and identity basically means the whole thing. Um, so therefore the, the, the first principle you have to implement is just get rid of all the secrets. If there is nothing to steal from someone's laptop then that identity being compromised is not that big of a problem. So what do I mean by secrets? Uh, it's not necessarily just things like passwords. There are all kinds of secrets that attackers are looking for to get uh, access to your infrastructure. That's passwords, yes, uh, but also API keys, private keys, browser cookie session token, secret URLs. There are all kinds of information on a laptop that could be used to gain access to your infrastructure. So the first thing uh, that we advise is just get rid of it. Uh, get rid of all secrets. Instead, you have to use a cryptographic identity, which basically means it's a, a, a hardware-backed identity of, of a machine that user is using. So like every Apple laptop, for example, um, has a TPM, Trusted Platform Module, on it. And even if a laptop that your organization uses, if it doesn't have those, you could actually use like a, a biometric YubiKeys to implement same functionality via a USB. So then users would authenticate using combination of uh, uh, hardware identity. So it's like this particular laptop is trusted, but at the same time, they need to uh, provide their own biometrics to get access. So that's first principle, get rid of all the secrets. Uh, principle number two, you have to find a way to consolidate identities. Because uh, I said, like what I said earlier, is that you have hundreds of different technologies sprinkled all over your infrastructure. Not all of them are compatible with SSO. Because remember, uh, single sign-on and identity platforms, they are enabled by uh, open standards that exist in the HTTP kind of world, uh, like SAML or OpenID Connect. That's how SSO operates. But that's not compatible with uh, infrastructure protocols like SSH, MySQL, Postgres, and so on and so forth. Uh, so you have to um, find a way how you can consolidate identities uh, across all these different protocols and also, how do you consolidate identities of users and machines? You have to treat users and machines exact same way. Um, so that allows you to then implement policy in one place. So having a single source of truth for identity and a single source of truth for policy, that is what allows you to lower the operational overhead 
of programmatically, automatically managed policy for your infrastructure. And finally, if you look at what that policy is supposed to be like, uh, so I do want to uh, uh, agree with Jack strongly, is that the policy should be uh, basically just-in-time access. And I, I have my own term that I, pro that I wish I could popularize, uh, basically intent-oriented access. Here's what it means. We like to, all of us would love to know that in a steady state, when nothing is happening, nobody and nothing has access to your infrastructure. There are no back, like there are no deployments going on, no backups, no brick maintenance, nothing's happening. You have you in a steady state, which is most of the time. No one and nothing should have access to your infrastructure. So then if there is an event, there is a ticket created or or some kind of alert that, hey, we need to run the deployment of an application or we need to, I don't know, like, like scale up our infrastructure. So then the access needs to be granted on demand to whoever or whatever is involved into completing that task. And once the task is complete, then the access is revoked. So that, again, it's everyone is dreaming about actually having a system like this, but it's only possible if identity and policy is consolidated in one place. Um, and that's obviously what uh, Teleport is helping companies to do. Okay, great. So, um, you know, there are a lot of different competing priorities that security and engineer, engineering organizations may have. So let's um, shift gears and take a look at what are some of the reasons why modernizing infrastructure access is an urgent initiative today? And I'll, I'll open that question to both of you. Well, I think, you know, we, we talked about it before and sort of in, in talking about what threats are available, what threats are, are happening today. And the key really is that um, identity-based attacks are very, very easy. They're incredibly easy. It's so easy to manipulate humans to giving up these shared secrets, right? And which is how, you know, password-based authentication one form or another, and even MFA-based authentication works is through the concept of the shared screen secrets. And it is so easy to manipulate humans in one form or another that we have to sort of very first steps really has to be how do we do something to eliminate that one way or another? And getting rid of the shared secrets eliminates the problem. And that's really what we have to start thinking about. And to me, tied in with that is also switching the way we think about protecting any part of our organization, particularly our modern infrastructure, is getting rid of the old concept of perimeter security. We used to think about security as we had, you know, it was the, we call it the castle and moat analogy, where all of our infrastructure is the castle and it is protected by a moat. And in the castle and moat environment, anybody who crosses the moat and is allowed inside the castle boundary is authorized to do stuff. See data, access data, see infrastructure, figure out what's going on. They can see all the different parts of the castle, get anywhere they want and do anything they want. And that's just really bad for security because once the bad guy manages to cross the moat, they have access to everything. And so we really want to switch that and go to what's now called zero trust. And that's really flipping that concept on the side, upside down and saying there is no moat. And the only way you can get access to anything in the environment, whether you know even the drawbridge or the castle grounds or the castle or anything, is by proving who you are and that you are authorized to be there and to do things and see things. And that really changes the nature of security to becoming much more strong. And sort of another way to think about it is we're going from a default of allow anything to a default of deny everything and allow only authorized users to do things. Uh, so I think that's where organizations really need to start thinking about it for their entire infrastructure, and particularly for modern infrastructure, since once anybody gets inside, they have the ability to do so much so quickly. Great, thank you. And, and Ev, are there some other trends that you'd like to talk about that are driving urgency around these issues today? Uh, absolutely. Before I go there, I do want to, because uh, Jack just brought like a, a very interesting topic of zero trust. I actually noticing that people are confused by that term simply because it's been used by every single company in cybersecurity space, like quite literally. Like go to any cyber company and on the front page, they will say zero trust. 
Uh, so naturally, people are confused, and some are even dismissing that. As I always just buzz term, it doesn't really mean much. Um, no, it's actually an extremely important concept. And maybe to simplify the meaning of zero trust for uh, most people, I would maybe, uh, I like offering this analogy. Like zero trust effectively says that um, any computing device is equally secure being on a private network or on a public network. It basically says that the net, your network neighborhood doesn't matter. And if you want to ask yourself, is my infrastructure truly, really zero trust? The answer is, can you compare it to an iPhone? Think about an iPhone. iPhone is a perfect zero trust device. It's essentially a server built and managed by Apple iPhones run on public networks and private networks. Like they're not hidden behind any kind of firewall. They're not using network perimeter security to protect themselves. They're equally accessible. And Apple is managing billions of these iPhones all over the world and everything is fine and secure. So if you could open up the gates, you could get rid of all your firewalls and give every server in your production environment a public IP address and you could sleep at night really well, that means you truly achieve zero trust. Making every server in your organization behave like an iPhone, that's what zero trust is. Obviously, it's hard to achieve, but we should try because the security benefits are tremendous. It means the blast radius of any successful attack will always be contained within a single device, a single resource. Now back to your question about the sense of urgency. Um, why modernizing infrastructure access is important now? I um, I might maybe offer an like unusual view on this because it's a uh, general trend is that operating infrastructure is getting more and more expensive over time because of that growing complexity. So the, the access to having access to my customers, I've always been asking them this question. How's the size of your DevOps team growing relative to the rest of the engineering? And almost everyone says that my DevOps team or platform engineering team is growing faster. It basically means that operating infrastructure, securing infrastructure is getting more and more expensive over time. And also there's a talent shortage. There are plenty of organizations and we, and I believe we do have some data in Jack's paper on this too, that uh, the talent shortage uh, uh, on, on, on security side is, is severe. So therefore, organizations, they, seem, they must find a way to lower the operational overhead of securing their infrastructure. And they have to find a way to make the security posture not deteriorate with as they scale. Otherwise, they will simply run out of money because managing infrastructure, again, is getting more and more expensive generally, and security is a part of it. Okay, great. So um, the last topic before we turn to Q, uh, Q and A, uh, let's talk about benefits. So people do undertake um, these privileged access initiatives that are geared for modern infrastructure. What benefits can they expect to realize both qualitative and quantitative? And that question is for both of you. So I'll start, uh, I will maybe uh, let Jack speak on security and risk management benefits, but I will mention something that almost every customer of ours that, that told me. They said that one of the unexpected benefit that they appreciate the most um, about um, um, kind of embracing all these modern access principles that we talked about was increased, dramatically increased engineering productivity, which effectively means time to market. So one of them shared an anecdote with me that they've been building on this like, really, really complicated system and they were uh, extremely excited to launch it. They made all the announcements, their customers are expecting like launch to happen on time, but then their own DevOps team actually uh, halted the progress and said, hey, we cannot be launching this because we don't know how to secure Cassandra. Cassandra was apparently the new technology that this solution was bringing into an organization and they operationally just simply didn't know how to do it securely. So that slowed everyone down. Um, our customers also sometimes use this kind of language that, hey, but by employing all this zero trust and secretless access principles, we shorten the, the, the path for an engineer to do like anything around here, which leads against to much, much um, higher uh, productivity. So shortening time to market uh, surprisingly could be a benefit of modernizing access to your infrastructure. I think there, there are a couple other things that uh, we see happening. Um, you know, we expect obviously increased security, reduced risk, but there's a couple of ways that are not obvious that that happens. 
Um, one is, you know, there's a what people think is a trite but still very true adage in cybersecurity, which is you can't secure what you don't know about. So having visibility into your infrastructure is very important so you can secure everything. And in the modern infrastructure with DevOps, things are changing so very quickly and uh, automatically changing and new technology is coming about every couple of months. And now with AI, AI is creating new technology on top of AI. And there's all sorts of ways that we're using infrastructure we didn't know about. When, and when an, a DevOps engineer and an admin logs into or configures a new system, oftentimes they do it using a shared identity, whether it's the, the master uh, cloud identity or uh, a root user on a particular server or something like that. So it's very hard to know what they're doing and to attribute an action to an actual human who desired that action to take effect and, or who made did that actual action. So with a modern system to control privileged access to your infrastructure and to um, do authentication and authorization, you also get logging and visibility, and then you get forensics after the fact where you can look and see, okay, something went wrong. Now we can see what went wrong and who, you know, who made the mistake. And it's not necessarily because we want to lay blame. It's because we want to do corrective action. Um, you know, in, in the um, uh, medical world, they have something called CAPA, which is corrective action, preventative action. It's after you identify that something went wrong, you figure out what went wrong, why it went wrong, and then you institute a corrective action to fix that particular issue and a preventative action to prevent it from happening in the future. And so we'd like to see you know, tools that enable you to do that in the cybersecurity space. And I think what, uh, you know, Teleport is doing does provide that capability. And so that's another benefit that you get that you don't think about in addition to just traditional reduced risk. Great. Thank you, Jack. Um, so now we'll turn to a couple of uh, questions that have been posted. Um, as we do that, I just would like to point your attention to a survey. It's a very quick one to two question survey, and we would uh, invite your feedback on whether you found what we talked uh, about today useful to you. Um, but uh, let, now let's turn to the first question. So one of our uh, viewers has asked, and I love this question because, um, you know, I, I talk frequently about the emerging role of the chief trust officer in an organization. And I think it's just such an interesting uh, role with many different dimensions um, for for how you drive trust into the company, into the customers, into the market. So our, our viewer has asked, I believe in the field of cybersecurity, counter ransomware and counter deepfake solutions will become more important than ever this year, referencing, of course, the uh, major elections that are taking place around the world. We are already thinking about zero trust in the cybersecurity area. How do we create human trust? So I'm I, sorry, can, how do we create, I didn't hear you, how do we create human trust? How do we create human trust around this? That's a, a really interesting question. Um, and uh, I think the tools um, help you reinforce trust, not necessarily create the trust, if that makes sense. I mean, what's your thoughts, Ed? So, <laughs> it's a uh, it's it's a loaded question because it's it's on this kind of interception intersection of kind of humanities and and, and technology, uh, like. But I will say though that in in the field of cybersecurity and computing in general, trust is it kind of has definition. So, for example, um, most of us probably probably saw like a, o older hacking movies where like they would refer to this famous orange book uh, like every hacker had to go and learn what's in this kind of magical orange book but when i uh, started to hear this uh, reference to that orange book when i was a teenager i looked it up and apparently yes indeed there was a book published by department of defense u.s department of defense it was indeed orange in color and i believe the title was uh, the criteria of determining trustworthiness of a computing system. So that book effectively answers the question, what is trust in the digital domain? And uh, I, I'm not going to uh, like quote the entire book here, uh, but the point is 
like all of that criteria that was mentioned in the book, traditionally has been implemented by operating systems. Going back to how you, Jack, started to answer the very, very first questions, like back in the day, we all had one single computer, one giant beast in the basement. So that beast actually provided us with trusted computing environment because that beast ran an operating system, maybe some kind of Unix variant, uh, and the operating system uh, enforced trust. Every process, every user had an ID. Remember UID, user ID, IID, PID, process ID. So there was a single source of SWIFT for policy, so you could define who can and cannot access what. So the overall system was trustworthy. And that book actually lists the criteria how to determine trustworthiness. So therefore, if you ask me, how do we implement like a trusted computing in the cloud? I say, we need to scale up these concepts and make them bigger than a single machine. So if you could reason about the entire cloud environment the same way how a Unix user can reason about the mainframe, then I would argue that you achieve the trusted environment. But how do you scale it to like internet uh, scale? So then you say, all oh, everyone and everything on the internet is trustworthy. So now we're talking about sci-fi, but hopefully it will happen in the future. Okay, so um, one of our viewers also asked if there'll be a high level demo within the session. Um, we will not be doing a demo here today, but we can point you after the call to a couple of places where um, you can get your answers questions, uh, your, your questions answered about how this works. And so um, we'll, we have a closing question here and um, I'll, I'll ask this of both of you as well. When you're talking about privileged access with companies, what are the questions that come up the most often? Uh, uh, let me give a quick answer and then I'll let Hef talk. But I was going to say the, the biggest sort of question is always, you know, sort of where do I start to get more security, right? And how do I how do I increase my security and where do I start? And I go outside of privilege access to sort of what I consider fundamentals of security, which is um, start with mandatory MFA for every users. And really, if you can do it, mandatory switching to passwordless authentication instead of password based. And uh, it is just uh, MFA and passwordless are such a huge win. Um, just a quick antidote, I talked to uh, the CISO, the Chief Information Security Officer of a financial services organization with 50 million customers. And when they men implemented mandatory MFA for their customers, they saw the volume of attacks, not successful attacks, just the volume of attacks against their organization drop by 95% in two weeks. Right, because it just makes it that much harder for attackers to get in. Um, and so that's really sort of the starting point. And I think that that's, you know, when you think about PAM, before you even get there is think about eliminating secrets from your environment. And then Ev, I'll get, let you give your answer. So I, I, for some reason, I've always been getting this question and almost every session where I would be talking about the importance of getting rid of all the secrets, because just presence of a secret of any kind is a vulnerability in our opinion. And people say, but you surely cannot get rid of all the secrets. There must be a secret somewhere. Well, those who understand kind of PKI technology and public cryptography and how like, certificates work, people generally understand that yes, you could issue a certificate or you could sign something uh, and there's an expiration date because certificates have a TTL. So all of those things are ephemeral. So once they disappear, they are, uh, disappearing but there is one secret though that is indeed a uh, uh, present so that's a private key of a certificate authority and the answer is like the way you could you could get rid of that one is to use ticket into hsm a hardware security module or a cloud-based equivalent so what that means is that that secret now while it still can be used to issue certificates and to do signing uh it's not accessible to software so which means that uh, no one can steal it by like uploading, downloading, cloning, or uh, getting other forms of kind of software access to it. So that really, truly is how you achieve kind of secretless system, where like the only secret that exists is a private key of a CA, and CA is stored in a HSM. And the second question, which almost always comes up in that uh, environment, is that hey, if I start migrating my workforce to a secretless access to passwordless access, and we will start relying on biometrics. So some of my engineers or uh, other employees, they might be concerned with privacy, like about privacy, because, hey, uh, they would say sometimes, I don't want to contribute my fingerprint to the company. Like it's my private information because people sometimes don't understand how the technology works. 
And the way it works is that you, the, the fingerprint the reader is directly connected to a TPM, a hardware module on a laptop. And um, so it never leaves the machine. It's not getting uploaded or downloaded anywhere. In fact, software doesn't even have access to your fingerprint. It's the TPM actually that's doing uh, validation of a fingerprint and then simply produces true or false answer. That, uh, that could be used for authentication purposes. So there is no violation of privacy. I also noticed there's an interesting question here that I, I do want to answer because someone says, like, hey, how can teleport be broken? And please don't lie about your tech, tech weaknesses. So I, I'm not going to lie. So first of all, teleport is a piece of software that uh, can easily, and that, and if we um, truly believe in what we say about the importance of human errors, I will say that misconfiguring teleport, not using it properly, uh, making a mistake when you're setting it up, when you're provisioning it, that's really probably um, the, the easiest at, at attack vector. And second type of human mistake is that if we made a mistake when we were building teleport, if there's uh, some software bugs in it, and in other words, uh, something we don't know about our own code is a vulnerability. So for this reason, we bring external auditors who audit teleport uh, line by line, and we publish results of these audits on our website, which actually makes us uh, quite unique. All right, fantastic. So um, with that, we'll we'll end here. So I'd like to thank uh, both of both of our speakers for joining today, and of course the the viewers. Um, so we hope we've, you found the conversation about privileged access valuable, and we look forward to seeing you at the next webinar. Um, and I'll just remind everybody to expect um, a link to the white paper uh, within the next week or so. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.